Hi guys, good morning. This is Luca from LucaLampero.com and today we're going to have a kind of different video where I'm going to answer your questions the way I did it before. Uh, mind you, all the questions I've collected are in English, but at the end of the video I will ask you to ask more questions and you can ask them in any language you want as far as, as, as long as I actually know these languages and I can reply. Without further ado, let's get started and let's read the first question, which is by Jonathan Quiros. Uh, Luca Lampanello, it's great to see your videos. Thank you. I saw one of your videos about how to get from B2 to C1, and one of your tips is to read a bilingual books, but I don't have a bilingual book. That is why I bought two books of the same version. I guess here you wanted to say um, the two versions of the same book. Do you have a good method or uh, of how I can study them in an effective way? You didn't specify the language you are actually uh, currently learning, so I don't know, but depending on the language, some languages are more popular than others and it's easier to find bilingual books. That would be the ultimate resource because you have both versions of uh, both languages on two different pages and you can actually compare. But in case you cannot find uh, such resources because maybe uh, you're learning a, a language that is not very popular, you can always buy uh, the same book in two different languages, in your own language and in uh, the target language. And how do you go about that? Well, you can, for example, read the entire book in your native language so that you get an idea of the contents of the entire book and then you can read the book again in your target language, but I would not take this route. I would rather uh, have a more modular approach where you can actually compare smaller pieces of content. Just to give an example, you could read one paragraph in your target language and read one paragraph in your native language or the other way around so that you can compare the two paragraphs or you can compare two chapters or uh, you can compare mm, one page with the other. I would normally use uh, the page as your piece of content that you in which you can compare the two languages and you can use a, a pencil so that whenever you compare Comparing with your own native language will help you figure out the meaning of the words, but also the structure of the sentences. So this is my piece of advice, and I think it's a very good thing to have a book in two different languages if you cannot find a bilingual book. On to the next question by Sok Tao. Um, Luca, why I can't speak English until right now? I've been watching YouTube all day long and still cannot speak when I face native, I guess, speakers. Is my expectation wrong or the language does not work like that? Please answer my problem. And this is what I'm doing right now. So um, you can spend the whole day watching YouTube, listening to English and reading English, but you have to remember that speaking, listening, uh, writing, and reading are four different skills, and if you think about it, you learn and absorb them, you develop these skills through five, four different channels, which are your eyes, your ears, your hand, and your mouth. So you can spend a lot of time listening and a lot of time reading, which is great, it's input, but that is going to help you speak just uh, to a certain degree. If you wanna speak, you have to speak. You have to remember that if you want to develop, we, we call it speaking a language. Actually, speaking a language is a combination of four sub-skills, and these skills have themselves other skills. Again, it's reading, listening, speaking, and writing. If you want to develop your language skills in an organic way, you better develop all these skills. So on top of reading and listening to comprehensible and interesting content, which you're probably already doing, what I suggest is that you start speaking, possibly with native speakers on Skype or native speakers in real life if you have the chance and also writing because the combination of input and output is key. You cannot expect to develop great language skills or better speaking language skills if you do not speak. I hope I um, replied to your question. So get to it, speak as much as you can, find your gaps and then move on and progress in the language. It's not that difficult, it's just a matter of making it happen. <clears throat> Another question by Luciano Colmenares. I guess he's Portuguese or Brazilian. Hi Luca, I found this video very interesting and instructive as all the videos you make for us. Again, thank you for all the nice words. 
I have some questions regarding the position of our body while learning. Does it influence the way we learn? And if so, what other factors can influence us on our learning process? I found this topic really interesting and I'd like to know your opinion about it. Thanks in advance, Abuka. Yes, I think this is a very interesting topic. It's an often neglected. We often focus on learning how to learn, what happens while we hit the book, so to speak, but what happens before we start hitting the books is also very important. So that's the reason why I also recently made videos about setting up, having the proper setup to learn languages. I think that there's a number of factors that influence our ability not only to learn, but also to focus and to our energy, our concentration. First, where you learn. That is really important. Um, it can be a desktop or your place, it can be at your work, but that does influence your learning. If you are in an environment that in which a lot of people distract you all the time, that's not a very good environment. So that's the reason why I always wake up early in the morning and hit the books, so to speak, as soon as I can in my own room where I know nobody is gonna uh, is gonna get inside and at least until eight o'clock in the morning that's the reason why i wake up early that's also another important factor when do you learn i always make sure that i learn when i am relatively fresh and my energy is high that is in the morning so in my room in the morning where nobody disturbs me but there's another important thing to keep in mind and it is how i'm actually dressed as of now i'm dressed in the you know uh filming mode or working mode and the clothes that you wear do play a role as weird as it may sound in the way we uh learn we approach others you know when you're dressed really well have you ever felt like oh i'm dressed really well it makes you a little bit more confident especially if you have to give a presentation or at a job interview that's the reason why it also works when it comes to learning when I wake up, of course, I'm in my pajamas, but I make sure that I get dressed, uh, you know, as if I were to walk out because that also influences uh, my mood and my capacity of focusing better. And if I'm more focused, I learn better as a consequence of that. Also, uh, another thing to keep in mind is the position of your body. So uh, again, I'm here and as you can see what I normally do, I have my computer, but I also use paper. So I put my computer on one side, I put paper on the other side. I use the computer mostly for uh, listening. So I put it there, but I don't actually use it unless I have to use audio material. But the position of my body, this kind of position with the computer and with a piece of paper allows me to actually manage uh, to move from the dig digital to the real world and I can manage the two with two different hands. And also, and uh, the other, I would say, element that influences our learning is actually the tools that we're learning. And that's important. If you're using a piece of paper, you're probably going to be a little bit more focused than if you were hopping from video to video on, on the internet. I always say that the internet gives you speed and, and gives you access to resources, while a piece of paper gives you depth and helps you focus more. So also the tools that you learn actually do influence the way you learn. It's a combination of these factors. So you can experiment with these five, six factors and see what works best for you. But again, to answer your question, everything, all the small details, even the details that you would think are trivial account in your capacity of learning, staying focused and absorbing the information. Um, <clears throat> KO4536. Luca, as on easy languages, quite often there are 10 minute videos. So instead of fervently searching for three, four minute videos, why not divide it into three, four sessions? Uh, that's a very good question or observation. And I have done this recently, especially when learning Greek. What I normally do if I find, I found a very good channel, which is called Astronio in Greek, but it has very lengthy videos of 12 minutes packed with information. And sometimes I just don't have the time to go through the video the way I would like to go through the video, not just watching it, but re-watching it, taking notes, etc. So a 10, 11 or 12 minute video becomes a 40 minute training exercise. That's the reason why I break it down into three minute snippets. So I divide it into three parts and that's much easier for me because if I have a snippet of say three minutes, I can focus on that, that becomes maybe a 20 or 30 minute training exercise where I can do a number of things, a number of steps, watching it, listening to it, taking notes, um, grabbing a vocab, etc., etc., and I can break it down into three different days. So your 
question or observation is is to the point uh, if you find something that is too long but it's really interesting well why not break it down into easier and shorter versions or snippets that you can digest better luigi zambetti this is easy to pronounce uh, have you read every book on these behind you unfortunately i don't have right now i'm in another uh, location within my room <clears throat> so you cannot see my uh, bookshelves but the reality is that recently i've been telling myself that for every uh, 10 books i buy then i read just one so i'm buying many more books that i actually have time to read and that's fine i know that i will read all of them or almost all of them but the truth is i haven't read all of them because they keep piling up Having said that, I think one of the year, New Year's resolution is to stop buying books, focus on a few books that are important for me, both for my business, for my uh, education, and then I can start buying books again. On a final note, reading is really important. It can change your life, and if you can read on a piece of paper, you can actually read books like the way that were printed, it will help you also uh, not only practice uh, your reading skills, but also practice your focus. Because um, reading a book in plain silence is a revolutionary act these days, and a sub kind of uh, it, it's a yeah I, I would call it I would call it revolutionary. Just many many uh, more and more people have just abandoned reading books and I think it's important that's something important to do now on to the next question what kind of advice by crawl f668 what kind of advice would you give someone who works 80 plus hours a week and only gets on average about four hours of sleep a day I've been trying to learn Russian now for several years I'm still just a beginner I just cannot get things to stick to my memory well the first thing that comes to mind is that you should work less and sleep a little bit more I know that it sounds trivial but I think that I I have myself have been working a little bit too much and I told myself you know what you have to scale back because health is really important and also recently read a very interesting book which is called why we sleep by Jeff Walker who talks about the importance of sleeping so if you work 80 hours maybe if there's a possibility if there's a chance of reducing your working hours maybe because you've become a workaholic or because you know because of a number of reasons I think you should invest time on figuring out a way to reduce these hours and dedicate more time to yourself and dedicating more time to yourself means sleeping better eating better and learning better so if you have time if you create this mental time or this physical time for that matter you have uh, actually more hours or more minutes to dedicate to language learning you can wake up in the morning and dedicate 30 minutes a day to your Russian or you can do it in the evening this allows you to create a space where again learning every single day plays a major role and the, the other thing that um, comes to my mind here uh, in your comment is that you said I just cannot get things to stick to my memory with very little sleep your uh, your memory is just gonna you're just gonna get worse and worse because memory is directly connected with sleeping patterns and that's also one other good reason why you not only should find ways to learn Russian in a better way there's hundreds of methods but I think that there's an underlying problem of getting more sleep and I would start with that and if you create this mental time then you have time and energy and the concentration necessary to explore and experiment new ways of learning Russian <clears throat> but again if you want to learn Russian, apart from changing a few habits of your life, you have to stick to it uh, in the long run. So sticking to it even 15 or 30 minutes a day is really, really important. And you can only do that if you get enough sleep, you eat well, you open the window in the morning and say it's a beautiful day and it's time to learn Russian. The next question is by Mali Fit. Luca, how would you recommend practicing a language like modern standard Arabic where the language itself is not spoken in homes but only in professional settings? It makes the language process a tad bit more difficult. One of the reasons why I have been procrastinating when it comes to learning Arabic is that I got the impression, and I recently asked this on Facebook, uh, I've asked for help for those who, to, to those who know um, Arabic and some of its dialects or its, its local versions, as I call it, is uh, what to start 
uh, from modern Arabic or the local uh, dialect, dialect because as it goes, as truth goes, it turns out that uh, modern Arabic is just an artificial language, or maybe not an artificial language, but an official language that is used in, in the media, in literature, but is not something that people actually use on the street. So my answer here is if you want to practice a standard, modern standard Arabic, Mali, uh, well, I would say just mm, try to watch and listen to material in standard Arabic and also talk to uh, Skype with native, uh, native Arabic speakers who surely know or educated <clears throat> speakers and who can speak, can speak the language and you can practice uh, the language uh, with them. This is what I would do if I one day, and I will, it's on the to-do list, I will start learning Arabic. I think I will, I will both learn standard Arabic and a local uh, dialect. And I don't know, still don't know which one I should start from uh, first, but I think you can always practice the language uh, because there's so many resources out there. So, um, so that's, I hope that answers your question. Luca, John Janczak, uh, I've been studying Danish myself for a while now and I'm wondering what resources you're using and might recommend. This is pretty fresh because I've been learning Danish myself for uh, one month and a half or two months. And I'm using Asimil Danish with ease in the French version. <clears throat> so this is this is easy to uh, to reply. I've been learning uh, Danish. I've been learning with Danish Asimil Danish with ease, uh, the French version. I don't know if there is a version in English. For sure, there's no version in Italian. So I'm learning it from French, which is a great uh, advantage, knowing English and French. And then I would say Danish Pod 101. I have uh, downloaded everything. I think it's a great resource. I haven't started yet, but I will. Because my strategy is always that of uh, finishing, absorbing one resource before moving on to another resource. And the third thing I'm using for my motivation is on and off uh, watching mm, some videos on YouTube, especially Easy Danish, you have this fantastic series in all languages or almost all European languages, Easy Danish, Easy French, Easy Spanish. And I think the great thing about that is not only does it show mm, how people actually talk on the street because there's someone, you know, with a microphone going around and asking questions and to random, random questions to random people. So you get to see how people actually speak in real life. But it's also great for your motivation because when you see, you have audiovisual material and you actually see how people interact, you see the environment, you see Denmark, you see, you know, they, they talk about, they use slang, they talk about customaries, customaries, etc. It really motivates you. And I'm using the combination, a combination of these three resources. Obviously, I'm still a beginner, even if, truth be told, I do speak Swedish, which helps and sometimes gets in the way, but I will use a combination of these three resources until you feel that you've gotten a good level and you're ready to use another batch of resources. There's a lot of stuff out there. Matthew Davis asked me, Luca, would you make a video specifically about how you use Italki Skype lessons so effectively? Do you plan ahead? Do you make sure the teacher speaks only in the target language, etc., etc.? It's a very interesting question, and I will make a video about that. But for the sake of simplicity and, brevi and brevity, I would say that first, Italki is a great platform because it allows you to find teachers in any language, and you can find your own teacher. And, but how you use it, obviously, how you use uh, italk, italki uh, lessons is really important. I normally have, I uh, think and envision three phases. Phase number one is preparation. Phase number two is the actual talking or execution, as I call it. And phase number three is uh, reviewing. So I always make sure that I record the lesson, that I prepare a topic beforehand. There's a lot of ways to prepare um, a lesson and I train my uh, students in my coaching lessons to do just that and then you have the lesson maybe 30 minutes 45 minutes and then make sure that you record the lesson so that you can review it and here again there's a lot of interesting strategies to make sure that the information that you learn during the class during the lesson uh, is retained you retain it in uh, the long uh, term and another question by Matthew Davis if you don't mind, if you don't mind asking, what do you do about all your other languages? So I guess that 
This question is related to the fact that I am currently learning three languages um, at the same time, Danish, Greek, and Hungarian. So, Matthew, probably you're asking me, what happens, what the heck do you do with all the other languages that you speak? Because I often say that I've been learning 14 languages. Let's, let's put it this way, I have 14 languages in my arsenal, even if um, you know, Danish is a language I still cannot speak. It takes a long time to explain what I do in detail, but again, um, to, to put it shortly, in a nutshell, I have built a lifestyle which allows me to practice a number of languages on a daily basis, and it all comes, it all comes down to choices in life. At a certain point of my life, I told myself that, yes, being an engineer is cool, I, have, I do have a degree in, in, in electronic engineering, but communicating, uh, talking about language learning, traveling, conferences, living and breathing languages would have allowed me to actually use these languages much more than if I had, I don't know, uh, chosen another career. So I have uh, made a number of choices, a number of decisions, uh, which have allowed me to do just that, speaking a bunch of languages on a daily basis. For example, I live with um, foreigners. It's not that I am disgusted by Italians, it's not that I like Italians, it's just that it's a, it's a consistent choice to live with foreigners, which allows me, allows me to practice languages on a daily basis. The languages I've been practicing in the last two years in my own apartment are uh, Italian, English, French, Spanish, German, Russian, uh, Polish, uh, Dutch, just to give an example. So it's just eight languages. Right now I can use three uh, to uh, four languages uh, on a daily basis. The second is to choose a job that has to do, I chose a job that has to do with languages. So I give coaching sessions in multiple combinations. I can give a coaching session to an American who wants to learn Italian or French or German, and there's a lot of them, or a lot of Italians who want to learn English, French, German, or other languages. So this allows me to give coaching sessions on how to learn languages in a lot of combinations in multiple languages. So it allows me once again to practice languages at a very high level on a daily basis. And third, I have built a number of habits in my microenvironment, that is in my apartment and outside of my apartment, which allow me to learn and progress, make progress in a bunch of languages every day. Just to give an example, when I go to the kitchen and I cook around 1, 2 p.m., I always make sure that I listen to something either in Russian or in Polish, and I've built this, I've basically associated the act of cooking and eating afterwards with the act of listening to a language which is a little bit weaker than the others, like Russian or, uh, or Polish or Hungarian for that matter. And I have a set of habits which allow me to practice these languages, listen, read, uh, even speak on a daily basis. This allows me to um, keep using these languages. Obviously, there are languages that I do not use as much, for example, Swedish or Mandarin Chinese or Japanese for that matter are languages that are a little bit in the background. You have to imagine like having 14 languages, like having 14 friends and you cannot see them all, you know, you cannot dedicate the same amount of time um, to all of them. Sometimes they're closer to you for a number of circumstances, some friends and some others are in the background, you see them less often and sometimes the other uh, friends in the background, they come to you for because circumstances change. So it happens and it will happen that Japanese and Mandarin will knock on the door and say, hey Luca, we haven't talked in a long time, why not you know, start chatting again? Anyway, <clears throat> Juan Andres says, Luca, dot, how do you treat with procrastination? I guess you, he means how do you deal with procrastination? And my answer is that uh, like everybody else, I do procrastinate in a lot of things. That is only natural because our mind, we are homo, homo sapiens and we have the same brain that we had 200,000 years ago or maybe even more. And uh, 200,000 years ago, we didn't have the problem. Right now, you know, I, I can go to the fridge, I can open the fridge and, and get some food. I don't need to venture into some 
wasteland or some uh, forest where some tiger is gonna eat me. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because we have a natural tendency of saving energy and procrastinating because that's our biology. So I do procrastinate like everybody else, but I've put some, mm, let's say, some mechanisms in motion or I've, I want, I have to have some mechanisms in place to avoid uh, procrastinating. Just to give an example, in language learning, I procrastinate a little bit less because first, I love it. And second, I've built a system which allows me to learn on, on a daily basis. So, so I wake up, I do my bed, and then do or make my bed, and then I just sit down and, and um, hit the books. I do not procrastinate because I know that that's the very first thing I'm gonna do in the morning. So first of all, you can buy, uh, you can create a system where you know that at a specific time of the day, you're gonna do that. So no questions asked, you're just gonna do that. But another thing is to have post-its. I've figured out that you have post-its and if you remind yourself of doing stuff, well, that kind of helps of getting into the habit of doing things. And another uh, thing that I do in order to avoid procrastinating or reduce procrastinating, because I think that it's impossible to eliminate procrastinating uh, in general at all, <clears throat> completely, is to count from five to one or from one till five and tell yourself that no matter what happens, even if a meteorite falls on earth, you're going to do what you were set to do. You know, like that, if you can train yourself, even when you wake up and you say, oh my God, I have to get out of bed, count from five to one and no matter what happens, just stand up. And if you do that, you train your brain to do things even when you don't feel like doing that. We have motivation backwards. We think the motivation or the will of doing something is gonna fall from the sky and all of a sudden we're gonna feel motivated. But the reality is that you have to start doing something. You have to overcome that obstacle, that moment when your mind tells you don't do that. If you do that, you will see you'll get in the flow and you actually like doing that. For example, I don't know, today I'm really excited about making this video, but let's suppose that I was not excited. Once, once I start actually filming, I get into the flow. So it, what, what you really have to focus on and train your mind is just overcome that, those five seconds, 10 seconds where you don't feel like something. This applies to language learning and anything else in life. If you learn to do that, your life is gonna get much, much better in any field. Um, Luca B, Luca with a K. What do you think, how many times you approximately have to see word in different contexts to remember it? And I'm really interested in your frank opinion of gold list uh, method. Um, this is the last question. And I would say that the more times you get exposed to a word, the better. Meaning that the more time, the, the more you read, you listen, you, recent, you listen and read, you watch stuff, you speak the language yourself, the more probable it is going to become that you're going to get exposed to this language and that you're going to use, I'm sorry, that you're going to get exposed to this specific word and that you're gonna use it. So it, I don't think you should, you should ask yourself how many times you have to do that because everybody works, everybody's brain works in a different way. The only thing I can tell is that you have a set of words within the vast vocab in a language that we tend to use all the time. And if you read, listen, again, read and listen, watch stuff, a ton of stuff, massively, and then you also use the language, that word is going to be, is gonna happen, is gonna appear somewhere, you're gonna use it, and your brain is gonna absorb it. The more angles of attack you have, the better. So actually, sometimes language learning is a simple matter. You have to, get massive input because that massive input is great for your conscious and unconscious part of your mind and you have to use the language so that you actually learn to use that word from another perspective. You have to remember that when we use the term word, what is a word? Let's take the word game, right? I always use this word uh, game because it's a particularly interesting one. A word has a lot of it's called polysemic, can have a lot of meanings depending on context, can have different functions, can have different connotations. So it's actually a simplistic way when we talk about, oh, what does it mean to, to learn a word, to know a word? A word has a lot of different aspects and facets that you learn with time. That's what kids do and what we do uh, for that matter. 
as native speakers, we tend to see this word and use this word and hear different connotations and meanings through a lot of exposure. So again, instead of asking yourself how many times you should see this or hear this or do that, just uh, get massive exposure to the language and use the language as much as you can. Ask questions. When you look up this word, maybe look up different meanings and contexts of this word because uh, a word is a complex entity and you need to absorb its various facets little by little in the long run. So there you have it. I hope that these uh, replies were useful for you and interesting and I'm going to do this more often. Please write and drop a bunch of comments in the comment section below and ask your questions. Mm, this, this video has been mainly in English. I've collected all the questions in English and I replied just in English, but to make this even more interesting and like it did back in the day, we can make this video multilingual. So please ask the, the questions in any language you want, but keep in mind that I know 13 or 12 of them. So I will reply in the languages uh, that I know. I, uh, again, I really hope that you found this, uh, this video useful and I uh, wish you a fantastic day and see you in YouTube very soon. Bye.